bring in your booklet to church and home group. Uh, grab your phone, wallet, keys, Bible on your way to church and home group and this little bad boy. And uh, it's a terrific resource. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been doing these, uh, the daily readings uh, and they've been terrific. Uh, it's very achievable, just short passages. It might take about a minute to read. You can spend the next four minutes thinking about it and you've just read and thought about the Bible in five minutes. Very achievable. Uh, and uh, excellent, there's space for sermon notes, the home group study questions are in there. It's really like uh, a terrific uh, little booklet to have. So please be using that. Uh, a lot of time and effort was put into that. I don't mean to guilt you into getting one, but get one because it's a good thing. Uh, so with that little plug over, uh, let's read from the Bible. Luke chapter 6. Verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, this is Jesus speaking, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes a coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will be not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Joel. For those of you who are yet to meet me, I am uh, one of the pastors here. Uh, I'd love to meet you uh, at Newish, actually. So I'm going to Newish, and obviously you can tell who I am by my shirt, so you can come down the front and uh, see me, and we'll go get some grilled afterwards. Um, as Matt has already said, we're in a, a new series, or I guess this is the third week, uh, entitled The Unexpected King, as we look at Luke's Gospel, chapters 6 to 9, and we're doing this for about 16 weeks. That's a long time, and you probably think that's a long time for three chapters. Well, it is, but there's a lot of meat here for us to chew on, as you'll see uh, tonight. Uh, and if you have been here the last two weeks, or just in case you haven't, let me just do a very quick recap. Uh, pastor Rod, our senior pastor, uh, in week one talked about the Sabbath and how Jesus reinterpreted the Sabbath, but also how he healed on the Sabbath, which is, you know, a bit of a dodgy thing to do. You shouldn't do that according to the Jews. And so Jesus got a bit of conflict, started to get a bit of enemies. But then also last week, Rod talked to us about blessings and woes. And in particular, Jesus said this to his followers. He said, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. So Jesus talks about how his followers are going to have enemies as well. With all that in mind, we then come to today's passage, and Jesus says this, he says, But to you who are listening, that's key, because I know everyone listens to Jesus, he says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And so I'm going to pray as well right now, because... Unfortunately, not all of us here are going to listen to Jesus' words. Unfortunately, some of us are not going to like some of the things that He says to us tonight. And my hope is that's not the case, but it unfortunately might be the case. And so I'm going to pray that we have soft hearts and that we'd be willing to not only listen to the words of Jesus tonight, but to apply them in our lives as well. So let's um, come before God in prayer and ask for His help. Uh, Father God, we thank You so much for Your Son, Jesus. We thank You so much for how He loves us and loved us to the point of going towards dying on the cross for us whilst we were still His enemies. Father, we thank You so much for Your outrageous, reckless, incredible love. And Father, I pray that we may accept such love, that we may be blown away by it, but also we may try to imitate it and love people like You have loved us. And so Spirit, please be working through our hearts tonight. 
please soften our hearts and Lord, help us to apply this message and this passage and not just to take it in and think about it. May we leave here not smarter sinners, but instead people who love our Saviour more and want to follow Him more faithfully. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have any enemies? Do you have anyone in your life who doesn't like you, doesn't treat you well? Is anyone who you don't treat too well? Is anyone you're not on good terms with? Is anyone you're not speaking to? Do you have any enemies? Maybe, I'll give you a few examples. Maybe in your workplace there's Crazy Carl. You know, Crazy Carl that just puts you down whenever he can. Just he doesn't want you to succeed in anything, but he wants to take all the credit. And whenever you do something wrong, he just points it out so clearly so everyone else sees it. Or maybe there's Mean Megan at university or school. You know, she's just constantly gossiping about you, saying, you know, wrong things about you and trying to make you look bad in front of other people. Or maybe there's weird cousin Warren. You know, when you go to Christmas parties and he talks how, you know, nice things about everyone but you. He buys a nice present for everyone but you. And he just tries to put you down in front of the family and how you're not as good as him. Or maybe you have that crazy neighbor. If you haven't had a crazy neighbor yet, it's probably because you haven't moved enough. Or maybe it's because you're the crazy neighbor and you don't realize it. But if you've had that crazy neighbor and there's that patch of grass that neither you of you will mow, and uh, it just looks like a patch of grass to everyone else, but to you and that crazy neighbor, man, that, that's like the de- uh, demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, right? Like, no one goes near that. People go missing. On a serious note, do you have any people that you're not in touch with? Is there anyone in your family? Could be a spouse who's betrayed you, committed adultery on you, or even abused you. It could be a brother or sister who you've had conflict with and you haven't been talking to. It could be one of your own children who you've had a falling out with. They're probably the hardest examples. Maybe it could be a friend. Is there anyone in your life who you're just not on good terms with? Maybe you might not call them your enemy, but you know maybe they close, closely are. I was this week trying to think of uh, who are my enemies. Uh, and none of you in here came to mind, which is good. Uh, if I'm wrong, please don't put up your hand. Now is not the time. Uh, we'll do this afterwards. Um, but I, I did think of uh, one guy in particular when I was in primary, uh, pr- uh, high school. Sorry, But before I get to high school, let me tell you about primary school. So when I was in primary school, I liked dancing. I still like dancing, uh, just, just in case you're aware. I'm not aware, sorry. But when I was in primary school, I did tap dancing, you know, like the whole that sort of one. And uh, I uh, even did a Year 6 Talents Quest in a, um, a cowboy suit to my boot scooting radio, I think was the song. Uh, it, was, uh, you know, it was quite innocent, and I did a really good job, to be honest with you. But... Um, <laughs> I didn't think at the time that people would insult me over this. I was quite innocent. Um, But unfortunately, when I got into high school, people did. Uh, People insulted me and paid me out from uh, year 7 to 12. And there was one guy in particular who just had a gift. Like, it was just his gift in life. Just knew how to uh, make me feel bad. And um, he would pay me out for tap dancing to my face, behind my back, in front of my friends. But also, he'd even do so in the classroom. And I remember one time, I think I was in year seven or eight, you know, a little tiny job, pimply, like really nervous, and uh, doing my mass work while everyone else was doing their mass work, nice and quiet, and then Brendan just yelled out, tapper, 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 and the whole classroom would just burst out, you know, in laughter, and I'm just there, just like, what, what do I do? In that moment, if I'm honest with you, I didn't want to laugh, I, I wanted to get my mass textbook, and I wanted to go hit him over the head, you know, I wanted to hurt him badly. Whenever someone hurts you, I wonder how you respond. Or I wonder how you want to respond. My guess is, is when someone hurts you, you want to hurt them back. When someone insults you, you want to insult them back. When someone curses you, you want to curse them back. Which is what makes Jesus' teaching here tonight so incredible, but also so uncomfortable. When he says to us, and this is his big idea, it's pretty simple love your enemies. Love your enemies. I don't know about you, but when I hear that big idea and that big command, I have two questions that come to mind for Jesus. And my two questions is this. Is number one, how? Like, like, how can I do this? And then number two, why? Why would I do this? And thankfully, Jesus answers these two questions for us in the text tonight. And so that's what we're going to look at, uh, how to love our enemies, but also why we should love our enemies. And let's begin with the how. Uh, In verses 27 to 31, uh, Jesus basically teaches us roughly how to love your enemies. 
And what we're going to see here in particular is in the first two verses, Jesus is going to give us uh, sort of like three initiatives, things that we can do and be proactive in to love our enemies. And then he's going to give us four examples of what it looks like to retaliate to your enemies in a way that is loving towards them. And so let's dig into this and Jesus' teaching. It should come up on the screen. And let's look at verses 27 to 28. This is what Jesus says. He says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And so church, if anyone doesn't treat you nicely, does bad things to you, says bad things about you, just isn't nice to you, what does Jesus say? Does he say ignore them? Does he say just you know, try and get out of their way? No, he says actually actively do good. Show initiative. And so what that means is for weird cousin Warren, when you're at the Christmas party, buy him a present. Buy him a good present and show your generosity and grace towards him. What it means for mean Megan, who's at university or at school, you share your notes with her. You be generous. You try and help her as much as you can. You go beyond. Or maybe for crazy Carl, who's in the workplace, you buy him a cup of coffee every Monday morning. I don't even explain why. But you just show generosity to these people who are not loving you, but love them. Do good to them. And when they curse you, Jesus says, don't respond by cursing them, but instead bless them. Speak well of them in return. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Let's say hypothetically, you know, MG came up to me and said, hey, Joel, have you been hearing some of the stuff that, you know, Mark Roberts, he's one of our pastors here, has been saying about you? You know, he's been saying you've got bad taste in clothing. You know, you're as weak as a toddler. You know, like I could respond and say something really mean, right? Like I could say something like, well, do you know that he wears three shirts on a Sunday? I could do that, but I won't. (laughs) Or maybe I just did. Or I could say, you know, actually, I I didn't know that's in Mark's character. I haven't heard him say that about me. You know, Mark, from what I can see, is a nice guy. In response to people cursing us, we can bless people, speak well of them. And yet Jesus says, not only do good, not only bless, but he also says, pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Man, that's difficult. I don't know about you, but if someone hurts me in that moment because, you know, I'm a good follower of Jesus, I might not retaliate, but later on, as soon as I get in the car, you know, I'm thinking, I'm plotting, I'm, re, you know, rehearsing that moment, thinking, oh, if I just said this, I would have just owned them, you know, or maybe at night as I'm going to sleep, I'm just dreaming, just thinking about what could I do to cause them as much pain as they have just caused me, and yet Christ says, pray for them, pray for them, pray that their, their behavior may change. And they may come to follow Christ and walk in His ways. You see, like I said before, I think sometimes when people treat us badly, we think the Christian thing to do is just to sort of, you know, be apathetic and ignore them and walk away from that situation and protect ourselves. And yet Jesus says, you know, take the initiative. Like I said before, I was trying to think of enemies in my life, and uh, thankfully I don't have any that really came to mind. But I did think of someone this week who I actually haven't been on speaking terms with, Um, not because there was a big conflict that occurred, but for some reason I just haven't spoken to a friend of mine in about four years. Now some of you are like, oh, I haven't spoken to many people in four years, that's okay. Uh, This guy was in my bridal party, he was a good friend of mine. And so after preparing for this sermon this week, I called him on Friday and just asked him, hey, what happened? Why are we distant? Why are we not talking? And he shared a few things with us and um, we both d- apologized to each other for not calling one another, and I had to apologize for a few things as well. But he's a brother. He was a good enough friend that I should have called him. I wonder if this week you need to make a similar phone call, or maybe write a letter, an email, a text, but show some sort of initiative to someone who maybe you're not on good terms with. And do so with grace, not pointing out their flaws or why you're not talking, just saying, hey, I'm sorry, I want us to be reconciled. I don't want us to be separate like this. And that's something that we need to do. Take the initiative, like Christ calls us to. That's how we love our enemies. But then also here, Jesus says, not only take initiative, but respond rightly. So let's, let's go through and let's have a look at verse 29 to begin with. Jesus says this. He says, If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Uh, before I was married, I had a lot of less worries in my life. Um, 
I have, I'm very thankful for my wife and kids, but let me just give you one example of what I mean. Uh, when I was at a party, or maybe I was at a pub, or I was in the city, and let's just say there's just some dodgy characters around, there's just people that just seemed a bit violent or seemed like they're up to trouble. When I was by myself, I wasn't too afraid, uh, not because I'm massive, but more because I'm like, I could hide, I could run, I could jump, I could skip, whatever I needed to do, but I could look after myself. But when I got married to my beautiful wife, and I love her, but I, I'm not that quick, but I am quicker than my wife, you know, I, I get anxious, I get afraid, especially when we go to pubs or different things and there seems to be some dodgy characters around. And so as a result, whenever that sort of situation occurs, in my mind I have a plan. You know, I'm thinking through what are we going to do if something goes down? What, what is going to happen? And let me tell you this, this was not my plan. What my plan was, this was not my plan, was to say to Emma, hey Emma, can you just take one for the team? Uh, you just step forward, I'm just going to run. And uh, just to be biblical on you, make sure when, when they hit you, just turn the other cheek also, right? Make sure you're Christ-like in this, in this situation. That was not my plan, right? I would have stood up for my wife. But unfortunately, I think some people can read this passage and out of context think that you know, self-defense or protecting your family is not something that you should do. And so let's try and understand what Jesus is trying to say in this passage by understanding the context historically of what is going on here. You see, in the chapter, not chapter, sorry, in the Gospel of John in particular, Jesus and uh, the author John talk over and over and over again how followers of Jesus are going to be kicked out of the synagogue. They're going to be kicked out of their Jewish community that they're a part of. And if you're a Jew who is part of a Jewish community and part of a synagogue, to be kicked out of that synagogue, that community of faith was a huge deal. Like that was your whole life. That was your family. That was your community. But to make matters worse, when you got kicked out of the synagogue because you're a follower of Jesus now, one of the Jewish leaders would slap you on the face to shame you. You know, not necessarily to hurt you, but just to shame you in front of everyone and make it clear that what you were doing is pathetic. And it's in that context that Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate and fight them back. Turn the other cheek. Or what about when he talks about how if someone takes your coat, also give them your shirt as well. You see, back then you should be aware of this. The book of Acts, it's so clear. It tells us Christians were being persecuted for following Jesus. Christians were being beaten up, imprisoned and killed for following Jesus. And another way they were being persecuted is people would come and grab their coat and take it away from them. And back then, people didn't have many coats like we're blessed to have. They probably had one, maybe two. And their coat probably also acted as their blanket at night. And so if you really want to hurt someone, take away their coat. And Jesus says, don't retaliate when people do this because of my name. Give them your shirt as well. It's pretty incredible. You see, Jesus is preparing his followers for persecution. He's commanding them to love, not to retaliate in violence. And if you're wondering, why would he, why would he want this? Like, I don't know if you have read the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 8, I think it is. But it's a beautiful story where Stephen just kills this, I mean, sorry, just um, preaches this killer sermon, right? Does this biblical theology and all, like just absolutely owns it. And you think that the people would respond in repentance and faith, but instead they respond by stoning Stephen. And in that moment, Stephen didn't pick up the stones and throw them back. He didn't retaliate or curse them. But just like his, like his Savior Jesus, he's like, Father, they don't know what they're doing. And he died for Christ's sake. And it's a beautiful story, even though it's a violent one, because who was standing in the audience but other than Saul, who became Paul, who ended up writing most of the New Testament, ended up becoming a gospel beast that planted churches throughout Europe. What a, a beautiful story that is if we love our enemies like Christ calls us to. But let's, let's keep going. Let's see what verse 30 means as well. Jesus says this, Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs, sorry, what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do as to others as you would have them do to you. You say, same thing's going on here, persecution, right? And what was going on is that everyone knew Christians were generous, that they wanted to give like Jesus had given them salvation. And so people would come to the Christians and ask for money, never expecting to pay it back. They wanted to use Christians. They wanted to take things from them, take their money off them. But then to make matters worse, Christians would also go visit other Christians who were in prison at the time. And while you're visiting maybe your brother or sister in prison, someone would spot you and then go to your house and rob your house. And Jesus says, don't demand it back. Don't demand it back. Do as to others as you want done to you. Specifically, Jesus is saying, do unto others to these people who are outside of the kingdom of God, who are not followers of Christ, who don't understand the gospel, do good to them. 
just like you'd want them to do good to you if you were in their position and you didn't understand the gospel and you were acting in such a way. Now, before we move on, I, I need to do two sidebars here. Sidebar number one is what Jesus is teaching us here is how we treat and love people who are outside of Christ. There are principles here for us to learn. So if a Christian brother or sister is treating you badly, you ought to show them grace and love them. But I want you to understand this. If you're a follower of Christ and if you act in this manner, if you beat someone up, if you steal from them, like uh, go on and on and on, take advantage of people, that's not, that's not okay. You're a follower of Christ and you should be held accountable to that by your brothers and sisters and by your church. And so if stuff like that happens, please don't just take that, but we've got to make sure that people actually are aiming towards holiness and becoming like Christ. So that's first sidebar. Second sidebar is what Jesus is not advocating here is domestic violence. He's not. And so I want to make this so clear. If, if you're in a relationship where you are being abused, be it by your spouse or some other family member, can I make this abundantly clear that you need to get out and come talk to myself or to Mark or to Rod or someone you know and love or the police. But know this, that the Bible does not justify domestic violence or abuse. It doesn't even matter if the abuser is not a believer, you need to get out. I want to make that really clear. Saying all that, though, I also don't want to give us a way out. Okay? Now you want to think, oh, what do you mean by this, Joel? Well, let me give you an example, right? Let's go back to Crazy Carl. I think he's in your workplace, I think. I want you to imagine with Crazy Carl. Let's say he's saying bad things about you. You could go to your boss and say, you know what, I'm being bullied in the workplace. I want you to fire Crazy Carl. And then he might fire Crazy Carl. Or if you can put up with it, maybe you could actually respond the way Christ is calling us to, to love your enemies, to show grace to him, to love him, to care for him, to buy him coffee, to, to do what you can. Or maybe if you had that you know, insane neighbor who is at the point now where he's egging your house every time you go to church, you, know, you could buy him a new carton of eggs every Sunday and go give it to him you know, and say, I hear you're missing some eggs. Look, I, I know this is not easy. Uh, I want to be honest with you. There's times where I've wanted to respond in a non-Christ-like way. And at times, there's even been people in this room have, who have encouraged me not to do that, which I'm so thankful for. This is not easy. My guess is, if you've been a Christian for a little while, or maybe if you haven't, you've probably experienced persecution because you follow Christ. Maybe people have called you names, people you love and care about who have hurt you. And in those moments, you could just walk away. You could just give yourself distance from those situations. And yet Christ calls us to love, to love. And look, I know this is uncomfortable. I know this is scary because it takes vulnerability and generosity from us. And that's exactly what Christ did for us, didn't he? But maybe you still need some extra motivation for this, and I don't blame you. So let's have a look at verses 32 to 34. Because uh, this moment on which Jesus talks about the why, the why behind we should love our enemies. So let me read to you verse 32 to 34. Jesus says this, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Now, there's uh, two, I guess, points of motivation here that I just want to point out. The first one here is, I wonder if you notice, is that Jesus was comparing uh, sinners with saints, basically. And like Jesus knows the human heart so well and how we constantly are comparing ourselves to other people and how that motivates us to do certain things. And so Jesus here compares those who follow him to people who are sinners, and says, look, you're supposed to be different. You're supposed to look different. You're supposed to love in a different way. This should motivate you to love your enemies. That's one motivation. But a second one is this, is Jesus basically says, it's, it's a benefit for you if you love your enemies. Like, I wonder if you notice that three times Jesus repeats, what credit is it to you? What credit is it to you? What credit is it to you? In other words, how does it benefit you? How does it benefit you? How does it benefit you if you just love like everyone else loves? If you're not different and Christ-like, you may be wondering, well, what, what is he talking about? Like, what benefit is there in loving people who do bad things to us? Let's have a look at verse, I think it's 35 to 38. Jesus says this, But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. 
a good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The first reason that this is to our benefit is because when you love your enemies, you, just, you demonstrate the love of God. When you love your enemies, you demonstrate the love of God. I think there's two benefits here that I can pick out, and that's the first one. And hopefully it should come up on the screen. If you love your enemies, it will demonstrate the love of God. You see, when Jesus says here that you will be rewarded, you'll be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, what the Greek can also be translated is, is like this, is that you will be viewed as, you'll be seen as, you'll be known as sons of the Most High God. You see, what I want to make clear here is that Jesus is not saying, hey, look, if you forgive, if you do not judge, if you do not condemn, and if you're generous, then I will forgive you and I will not condemn you and I will not judge you and you'll be my children. It's not saying that. That is religion. That's about if you do something, you get something. No, we're about grace. Jesus is about grace. What he's saying here is that if you forgive, if you do not judge, if you do not condemn, then you're making it quite clear that you have been forgiven that you have been loved, and that you are children of the Most High. And that is a blessing for you. Because the more you become like Christ, and the more you demonstrate that, that will be an assurance to your faith. As you grow and mature and become more like Christ, that will be good for your own soul. But obviously, it will also be really good for those around you, won't it? As they see love that is formed in adversity. This would be amazing for your evangelism and your witness. So that people may look at you and they may be like, man, this person is a freak. They are so weird. Like we keep on hating them and they love us in return. If there is a God, surely this weirdo knows him. One of my uh, favorite movies of all time, but also most recently because I watched it recently, is a movie called Hacksaw Ridge. Um, It's heads up. It's not a movie that you watch with your kids. Uh, It's quite a violent movie, uh, as this picture will show you. Uh, But let me explain the movie to you. It's a, a movie about a Christian man called Desmond Dawes who was a faithful Christian man and a conscientious objector in World War II. a matter of fact, he's the first conscientious objector to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And so what is Desmond's story? Well, let me explain Desmond's story to you. Like I said, he was a Christian man, and he was convicted to not hold any guns in the war, but he still wanted to go to war to support his country and to love people and to help people. And so he did that. But when he was in training in the infantry, he would get abuse, both physically, verbally, he'd literally get beaten up by his fellow uh, mates who were in the barracks with him because they didn't want to go to war with Des because they thought that he wouldn't have their back. People would bash him up, and on top of this, his own commander, Captain, I think Captain John Glover, also hated Des because he thought he was a coward, that he had no bravery because he wouldn't hold a weapon. And so John Glover tried to get him transferred away from his unit and maybe even kicked out of the army. He just wanted nothing to do with Desmond Dawes. But Desmond persevered. He went to World War II and he went into the battlefields with these same guys who shamed him. And at the famous Battle of Oikinawa in Japan, in one of the bloodiest battles of World War II, Desmond showed his bravery. See, I don't know if you know much or if you haven't seen the movie, but basically at this battle, the Americans land on this beach and they've got to try and basically get up this cliff face. And the only way they get up this cliff face is to climb up this huge uh, wooden ladder. Then they get up to the top and then at the top, there's a whole lot of Japanese with machine guns and artillery ready for them to obviously defeat them. And this was an incredibly brutal battle. Thousands of people died. And the Americans went up time after time after again. And the movie does a great job of illustrating this one time where Desmond went into this battle with no guns, just there to help and heal people. And people are dying left, right, and center. The Americans got absolutely smashed on this day to the point when they all started retreating back down the mountain, back down the ladder, and no one wanted to be up on that surface. There was lots of American soldiers who were still injured, and had no one to help them. And yet Desmond didn't evacuate. He didn't retreat. He stayed up there, and for hours on end, he went and he crawled along through the fire, tried to keep himself hidden, would grab an American soldier, would heal them or help them, bandage them, and literally he would drag them by himself all the way down to this cliff face, and then with a rope, he would use some sort of system to like levy them all the way down to the ground. He was my size, obviously a lot stronger, And he did this for hours on end. And I love this quote of his. As he did this, he was praying the whole time, saying, Lord, please help me get one more. Please help me get one more. He did this for hours when no one else was around. And he even found Captain 
John Glover and lowered him down as well. He saved 75 men at this battle doing this. And when he got down, the same soldiers who shamed him now praised him, blown away by his bravery and his faith. It's an incredible story. What I also love about it in the movie, I don't know if this is true, but that even on the next day before they went back to the, um, the battlefield, um, the Navy as well as the Army waited until Desmond had done his morning devotions because they knew he loved the Lord and they would not go to war without Desmond. Church has an incredible story of a man's convictions to love people well. And actually, matter of fact, the true story is, is they actually found some Japanese that were also healed by Desmond as well on the battlefield. What an incredible man. And yet, you know what? You and I, we may not be on the battlefield like that, but we can love our enemies like Desmond did. We can demonstrate the love of God that he clearly did. And so that's the first benefit. The second benefit, by loving your enemies though, is that you can deepen your love for God. Is that you can deepen your love for God. You see, I think most of us know this reality about um, humankind, is that each of us here want to be loved. Each of us here long to be loved. We're going to be loved by our family, by our friends, by people around us. No one wakes up and goes, you know what, I just want to be hated today. No one wants that. And yet the unfortunate reality, you know what stops that from actually becoming reality and everyone loving us is actually ourselves. Because the unfortunate reality is, is every single one of us in this room has mistreated someone, has cursed someone, has hated someone unjustly, has said things about someone, has done things... And the reality is, is we block ourselves from receiving the love of other people. We're the ones that cause enmity between other people, but also, most importantly, we're the ones that cause enmity between us and God. You see, if you're new to church, you may think that you and God, by nature, are friends. The Bible is actually quite clear that by nature, you are enemies with God because of your rebellion and because of your decisions to not follow Him and praise Him and honor Him. But the glorious news of the gospel, which is why I'm up here speaking to you, is that God loves us whilst we're still enemies. That Christ was sent for us whilst we're still enemies, to die on the cross so that we may be transferred from being enemies to becoming children of God. Adopted enemies, yes, but we can become adopted children of God. I love the doctrine of adoption, but I wonder if you've also thought through, sometimes when we think of adoption and God's adoption, we might think that, yeah, when God adopted us, He was like trying to find that cute little kid with fuzzy hair that everyone wants to adopt. When reality is, is God's adoption of us is more like that, you know, that rebellious teen who's just been kicked out of foster home after foster home after foster home and doesn't want anything to do with anyone. That's who we are. And God grabs us and loves us with this amazing, outrageous, reckless love to the point that He sent His Son to die for us. And so, church, when we love our enemies, we grow in our understanding of Christ's love for us. And that deepens our love and affection for Him. Like, Desmond, it's a great story, I love it. But please, don't leave you thinking about Desmond. He saved 75 people, Jesus saved everyone. Like, think of Jesus, right? And how he's not just someone that says, do what I say, but don't do what I do. No, he says, do what I say, do what I do. Remember, after the Garden of Gethsemane, after he'd been praying, and the soldiers came to come and arrest him, Peter pulls out his sword, cuts off one of the soldiers' ear. What does Jesus do? He says, put the sword away. Grabs the ear and heals that soldier who's about to arrest him. As he goes to the religious leaders and the Jews and they come and they accuse him and they curse him, they spit on him, they slap him, they hit him, they punch him, what does he do? As he turn and retaliate, does he call down 12 legions of angels to come down and wipe them all out? No, he's silent. And then at the cross, Christ calls out, Father, please forgive them, they do not know what they do. Christ calls out for forgiveness, you know, even for the soldier who's nailing him there. Our Saviour is incredible. Let me never forget His love for our, His enemies, whom you and I were. And so Christians, tonight, please, I don't want you to leave here being moralistic people, just trying to love people better. Like, like I do want that, but I don't want that to be your number one priority. What I want you to leave here is with a greater affection for your Saviour, loving Him more, appreciating what He's done, and then in response going, okay, I want to be like Him. And if you're not a Christian here tonight, what I don't want you to do, once again, is I don't want you to leave here being moralistic. I'm going to be a better person. I don't want you to be an enemy with God. I want you to be a child of His. So I don't want to encourage you to repent of your sin and rebellion and how you've been enemies with God. 
and follow Him, praise Him, become His child, and love Him like He has loved you. Church, I know this is not easy, what Christ is calling us to do. And such love will be, mean that we'll have to love people, not based on circumstances, but based on convictions. But church, may we love people well because we have been loved so generously. May we give to people because people have given to us. May, may we be not afraid to be shamed because we know we'll be glorified in Christ Jesus. May we love like Christ has loved us. May we do that by the power of His Spirit, because let me tell you, you won't be able to do this. This is some divine sort of love, and you need Jesus to be able to do this. And so how about I pray that we can do this? Father God, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, it does pierce, it can hurt, but Lord, we do pray that You remind us, Father, that You are not a God who wants begrudging submission you're not a mean God, but you're a glorious God. You're not a, a God who's trying to suck away our joy like a Dementor from Harry Potter. You're a God who wants to give us joy. And Lord, we know as hard as this is that there is benefit in loving those who don't love us, that we can demonstrate your love as well as deepen our own love for you. And so, Father, I pray tonight that by your Spirit you may be working through our hearts. Lord, you may be convicting us of people that we need to think about how we can love them better how we can show initiative as well as respond rightly. Lord, I pray that you form us, that you chisel us to be more like Jesus and to be blown away by what he's done for us. And we pray all of this in his glorious and beautiful name. Amen.